jump in the rim. Jump, 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 jump. Everybody, if he goes to the left, then we'll go to the left. And if he goes to the right, then we'll go to the right. We're gonna dance, 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 dance in the rim. Dance, 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 dance. Everybody, if he goes to the left, then we'll go to the left. And if he goes to the right, then we'll go to the right. We're gonna jump, 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 jump in the rim. Yeah, there really is nothing good on TV these days. Elem Arfaksat Lud Meshak. Cool, cool. Hello, Meshak. Right, enough of that Pedro garbage. Get that rubbish out of here. Hello everyone and welcome back to our 4.30 service here at All Souls Youth Online. I was on holiday last week. Thank you so much to Freddy who uh, fantastically took over uh, last week. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Sorry I couldn't be with you, uh, but I was having a, a really difficult time uh, in, in that exotic hot place I was in. Now we're gonna get straight into it today, so starting things off once again, very quickly, we have the notices. Instagram, 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 Instagram. I'm so sorry to our editor. Instagram, 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 Also Souls Youth LDN, All Souls Youth LDN, All Souls Youth LDN, Instagram, 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 don't forget to follow our Instagram. We also have a Spotify playlist, which is still up. Type in Youth Lockdown on Spotify to find our Spotify playlist. We still have last week's incredible playlist from, from Jenel, Josh Menel, still up there, so do go and check it out. Even if you don't know him, the tunes are fantastic. Okay, you got all different kind of genres there to worship. I cannot wait to do my playlist. It will be something you've never heard before. That is it for the notices. So wait, no, no, okay. Oh, sorry, yeah, Bible, Bible studies five and six. Bible studies five and six are now online. You can download those and check those out. They're really quick, one page studies. They, they can take you uh, a very quick few minutes if you wanted to, or you can spend as long as it as you want. Obviously, the longer the better, but do check it out. Those Bible studies are now online. respond to injustice in the world? How do you respond to injustice committed against you? The Psalms are God-inspired words spoken back to him, often words spoken in the face of deep injustice. The Psalms shape us so that we respond in a godly way to the sin in ourselves and in the world. Now these Bible studies are there to show us that the Bible has something to say to every aspect and every area of our life uh, while we're here on earth. And this includes the, the absolute madness that we've been seeing uh, on social media, the madness that we've been seeing uh, in the world around us, in the USA, in, in the UK. It's not the USA alone, it's all over the world. It's the issue of racism. 
and, and the George Floyd uh, murder has really revealed um, and exposed a lot of the, the systematic racism, um, a lot of the very open racism that takes place in the world. And, and, it's, and it's, the world has shown a cry of anger. And we think we need to address that. We need to know what the Bible has to say on the issue of racism. We want to raise awareness to things that aren't being talked about enough. So this Sunday, Trev's going to be talking to us specifically on the issue of racism. And we're going to continue that next Sunday and, and, and longer than that if, if we need to. So we're going to be jumping through loads of different passages in Genesis and Luke, all over the Bible. So we think it's important that you grab your Bible uh, and see this for yourself in front of you so that when you need to raise this issue or you need to speak about this issue, you can point to it, you've read it, you say, it's right here. Look at what the Bible has to say. So we're going to do another Bible break. Let's go. Hi guys, today I'm going to be doing part of the reading. So today I'm going to read from James chapter 2 verses 1 to 5 and then I'm going to skip a little part and read from verses 8 to 13. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favouritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? And I'm going to read verses 8 to 13. If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbour as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favouritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Well, welcome to All Souls Youth London Live Lockdown. Now, in the light of the incredibly sad events that we've seen in America these last two weeks, which was sparked by the brutal racist murder of George Floyd by four white policemen. As a youth team, we thought it would be good to look at the vital subject of racism. Now, when dealing with such a sensitive subject, right at the beginning, it's worth making sure that we understand what racism is. Here's the Oxford Dictionary definition, which I think gets it about right. Prejudice, discrimination, or antagonism directed at someone of a different race based on the belief that one's own race is superior. Now, as I start, I wanna make two things clear. First, this is a massive issue. So I won't manage to cut over a couple of weeks. Whatever I say is gonna be very limited. The murder of George Floyd may be the trigger as to why we're doing these talks. But as we will see, racism is a problem in the US and a problem in Britain today. Therefore, my aim is merely to lay down the Bible's most basic building blocks. There's much, much more I could say, but sadly, I'm not gonna have the time. Secondly, all of us are on our own journeys. And for some, the topic of racism, racism will be raw and it will be real. 
While for others, in most of their life, it's been distant and it's been distracting. My background when I grew up is, to say the least, completely different to what it is now. I grew up in a loving, white working class home in Chesington, just outside London. As I grew up, meeting someone from another race was, to say the least, a very rare event. In my infant school and primary school, I cannot remember any brown or black face in the school. In the church I attended every week, I cannot remember one brown or black face ever being part of the church family. When I got to my senior school, Southborough Boys, there was a thousand boys at the school, yet I can only ever remember one black pupil. This was the 70s and early 80s, where sadly, aggressive racism was common. I started to go and watch my beloved West Ham in the 1980-81 season at Upton Park in East London. One game I will never forget was when West Bromwich Albion came to town. At the time, West Brom were unique, but they had three black players in their team, Laurie Cunningham, Cyril Regis, and Brendan Batson. I say rare because hardly any teams had any black players, let alone three. Throughout the whole game, Every time one of the West Brom play black players got the ball, most of the ground would make monkey noises and scream vile, racist names at them. Some parts of the ground would even throw bananas at the black players. The game was 1-1 when Cyril Regis scored the winner with the last kick of the game. As I trudged out of the ground, Inside, I felt two things. Number one, what I experienced was vile and against the way I'd been brought up and the new Christian faith I now owned. Secondly, I was happy for the very first time in my life that West Ham had lost and I was happy that Cyril Regis had scored the winner. That day, I was introduced to what we'll call in these series of talks, aggressive racism. That day I experienced a whole herd of people thinking and acting as if their race was superior. Now thankfully in our British culture, at least in public life, this is seen for what it is, vile and wrong. But if we think that is the only face of racism, then we're very, very naive. Let me jump forward 40 years, for my journey, as I've said, has taken a very different path, and it could not be more different. I'm married to Eva, whose dad is Nigerian and whose mother's Polish. I live in central London and belong to a church with over 50 nationalities. My journey has gone from all white to as many colours and countries as you can think of. So, both the way my parents brought me up and my Christian faith have shaped the person who I am. And that'll be the same for you. Your upbringing, like mine, will have shaped how you think about the issue of race. Now hopefully, what we will see in the next few weeks is that the Bible goes much further than merely calling followers of Jesus not to be racist. What we'll see is the Bible teaches that a follower of Jesus is to be anti-racist, to learn to see injustice and speak out. Now, two books that have really helped me hugely have been Why I Don't Talk to White People About Racism and Why We Need to Talk About Racism. One written by a person who wouldn't claim to be a Christian, another written by a Christian pastor. Now, what they have done so skillfully is to show that there are two sides to racism within the British culture. The first is what I experienced at West Ham's football ground, aggressive racism. The other is far more subtle than aggressive racism, yet its effects can be just as damaging, for it shapes and it controls how people think about race. You could argue that subtle racism in the British culture today is affecting far more people. I would call this subtle racism. It's subtle because people don't see it, either in society or often in themselves. 
which is why it can be just as devastating, if not more, than aggressive racism. Let me give you a recent illustration to explain what I'm trying to get at when I say subtle racism. On December the 8th, 2018, Manchester City were playing Chelsea at Stamford Bridge. One of City's black players, Raheem Sterling, went over to take a corner. As he did, a couple of people in the stand, right, right by the corner flag, their faces were full of hatred. And what came of them out of their mouth was vile, aggressive, racist abuse, just as I heard at West Ham in the 80s. Now, thankfully, it was caught on camera and the guys were charged and banned for life from Chelsea's football ground. So how was Raheem Sterling going to respond? Was he just going to take on the aggressive racism? No. Skillfully, Sterling sought to highlight not the aggressive racists, but instead subtle ones. You see, Sterling told a story about two young players at his club, Phil Foden, who was white, and Tosin Adibayo, who was black. Both were very rich young men, and both bought a house costing two million pounds for their parents. Now, what we're going to look at is how the Daily Mail told both stories. They told the story of both the guys selling their house. Let's read what they say. Manchester City's Phil Foden has set up his future in the area by buying a new house thought to be worth around two million pounds for himself and his family, sports mail reveal. The 18 year old's parents, Phil and Claire, are thought to have been involved in choosing the house and he is determined to keep the close-knit family together despite his emergence as one of England's outstanding talents. Foden is thought to have no desire whatsoever for a lone move away from his home town club to give him more game time. Foden's close relationship with his parents, he still fishes with his father, makes him more suited to continuing his development at City. Now, as I said, when the same paper, the Daily Mail, Britain's second most popular tabloid, reported on Tossin's story, this is what he said. A Manchester City youngster who has never started a Premier League game has splashed out on a mansion with an asking price of 2.25 million. Tossin, who last year negotiated a £25,000 a year contract after threatening to leave, is the new owner of a six bedroom house in Cheshire. The 20 year old defender has made just seven appearances for the club in the Cup Games and the Champions League, but has never featured in the English Premier League. Last night, he was an unused substitute in City's 2 1 win over, Man over Bristol City in the Carabao Cup. Now, what I've just shown you is subtle racism. According to their teammate Raheem Sterling, they both bought their parents a home. Yet Foden, parents are, Phil Foden has a close-knit family, even mentions his mum and dad's name, Phil and Claire. He fishes with his dad, is, an, is England's outstanding talent. And notice, no details of the house or how much he earns. Rose Tossin, well, no mention of his family. He threatened to leave before he negotiated his £25,000 a week contract. Details of his mansion, loads and loads of pictures of it, whereas none of Foden's. One buys a mansion, the other a house. One splashes out, the other buys it for his parents. One is an unused substitute, the other England's outstanding talent. Now can you see how that is subtle racism? Can you see what Sterling was trying to do? We look at the aggressive faces in the football stand and we think that alone is racism. But Sterling shows that it goes far, far deeper in our own culture. Subtle racism hugely controls how people in Britain think about race and produces people who think in a racist way even without them even realising it. That's why it's so dangerous. Now that's my journey. Yours will be different. Different because of your skin colour. Different because of the location where you grew up. Different because of the age and culture you've grown up in. But as Christians, 
We believe the Bible to be the word of God. Therefore, it speaks into every context of life. It speaks into our life about race. All these experiences, the Bible speaks into. And in the next part of the talk, we'll begin to look at that. Now we are going to read from Luke chapter 9, verses 51 to 56. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem, and he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him, because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then he and his disciples went to another village. Toni Morrison was probably one of the greatest African-American authors. She grew up in the 1930s, 40s America, where racial segregation was the norm. One of her finest books is called The Bluest Eyes. And in the book, she, did, she tells a story of her friend. And one day they were having a uh, conversation and her friend declared to her that she no longer believed in God. When Tony asked her why, she confided that she'd been praying to God for two years, that God would change her eyes from brown to blue. And God had never answered her prayer. You see, Tony Morrison's friend quickly realised that the world that she was living in was run by white people. I wonder what you would say to Toni Morrison's friend. It's a tragic story, isn't it? That you would long to have eyes of a different colour and your skin a different colour. Well, let me raise the stakes a little higher. What do you think Jesus would say to Toni Morrison's friend? I'm pretty sure Jesus would seek to explain to Toni Morrison and her friend the truth of Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 27. Let me read it. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may, that, so that they may rule over the fish in, in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. When God made the first two human beings, they were made in his image. He was the one who made, designed and created them. Therefore, their worth as human beings is linked to his loving, colourful, created, life-giving character. When either Adam or Eve wanted to know their worth and their dignity, they looked in two directions. They looked at the beauty of what was made themselves and then the brilliance of the one who had made them. The primary source of their worth and dignity came from the God who made them, for it was his image that they bore. Jesus would say, the skin colour you have, Tony, Jesus would say to Tony's friend, the skin colour, the eyes that you have and their colour I gave you. And if anybody has a problem with that, Jesus would say, then they have a problem with me for it's my image that you bear. To remind Adam and Eve that God was their loving creator and rule maker, to remind them that God was the primary source of their worth and their dignity, he put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden. Look at verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. The tree, far from being a cruel test, 
was a constant loving reminder to Adam and Eve that God was their creator who loved them and gave them their worth and their dignity. Now, I think if I was Tony Morrison, my next question to Jesus would be, well, what went so wrong then? The events that have happened these last two weeks, it's right to ask, isn't it? What has gone so wrong? Well, Jesus would say the answer comes in Genesis 3 with the rebellion of mankind. Genesis 3 verse 6 says, When the woman saw that the fruit, that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. You see, the devastating effects of mankind's rebellion is that now they think that they can decide exactly where they get their own worth and dignity from. Instead of getting it from their primary source, their creator, they now seek to get it from themselves. They seem to get their worth and their dignity from themselves, or from something God has made. That would be devastating enough. But mankind also seeks, now, because they've rebelled against God, to dominate other people. And they dominate other people by thinking they can control what another person's worth and dignity is. They can control that. They can, the dominating people can put on another person what they think their worth and dignity is which is what I witnessed at West Ham in the 1980s, in the East London crowd. They were aggressively thinking that they were superior to the black players. The same was experienced by Raheem Sterling and by Tossin in those newspaper articles. Whether it be aggressive racism or subtle, the aim is the same, to dictate to another person what their worth and dignity is. Jesus would make it clear to Tony that when somebody does that, when somebody puts, dominates another and thinks they can decide what their worth and dignity is, Jesus would say to Tony, when somebody does that, they're picking a fight with the mighty creator, God. Now, I don't know if you've ever realised that Jesus' disciples were a bunch of racists and not the subtle kind, but the aggressive. If you look at Luke's gospel, you see it. Just let, let me read to you verse 51. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then he and his disciples went to another village. It's strange, isn't it, to think that Jesus' disciples had exactly the same kind of hearts as the white police who killed George Floyd. What do they want to do? They want to call down fire and destroy them. That's aggressive racism, all right. Nothing subtle about that. And what does Jesus do? He rebukes them. It used to be fashionable to wear those little um, things on your wrist, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Well, do you know what? We don't have to try to imagine, do we? Because we know what Jesus would do. If Jesus had been on the pavement when those three of those policemen were holding George and the other one had his knee, his knee on his neck, we know what Jesus would have done, don't we? I don't think he'd have stood by and recorded it on his phone. Instead, he would have rebuked them. But Jesus turned and rebuked them. When humans take on the responsibility 
of deciding someone else's worth and dignity, one of the tragic results is oppression, violence, and a sin of racism. But it's not only aggressive racism that Jesus hates, but also the subtle type as well. That passage we just had read from the book of James deals with subtle racism. In James, the issue is rich and poor, class, you could say. But it really doesn't take too much imagination to change the illustration to race, does it? It's all done so subtly as they edge the, as they edge the person of colour to the bottom of society's pile. The white footballer is England's outstanding talent. The family boy who fishes with his dad, while the black footballer is greedy, splashes out, earns 25 grand, and is ready to leave when he doesn't get his own way. Two young lads, acting in the same way, but the Daily Mail turns it into an opportunity for subtle, rank favouritism, racism. And Jesus would say to Toni Morrison, that is evil. Look at James chapter 2, verse 4. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? So to write articles like that and to believe articles like that is to have evil thoughts. Jesus would say to Toni Morrison, if they carry on like that, then they will meet my fierce anger. Look at, look at James chapter 2, verse 13. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. For a human being to think that they can decide another person's worth and dignity is, according to Jesus, evil. What would Jesus do with a racist? He would rebuke them. What would Jesus do with a racist? He would declare them evil. What would Jesus do with a racist? He would offer them freedom from racism and forgiveness. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Next week, we're going to look at the cross. We're going to look at how, what, the, the pattern that God gives the church for how we are to live in the beauty and the colour of so many different uh, races that God has made. But as we ponder what I've said today, I want you to think about a few questions. Tomorrow night, we're offering for the young people to come and have a forum to bring your questions. You can put your questions on, uh, you can send them um, on, the, on the Insta. You can bring your questions. We're gonna have a time where we can debate and discuss what's happening and what the Bible has to say on racism. But here's a few questions for you to ponder before then. Have you ever experienced aggressive racism or have you seen it? Have you or where have you experienced subtle racism? Have you experienced it or have you seen it? They're just two questions you can ponder for the next 24 hours or so. And then tomorrow night, we'll meet to discuss this more, if you'd like to come. Let me pray. Father in heaven, these are deep subjects. We thank you for the character of our God, who speaks into these subjects with light and truth. Father, as your people, we pray that you'll give us a great understanding of the times that we live in, through the power and the beauty of the character of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus. Amen. In light of recent events, I would like to share this song with you. Like the river I've been running ever since It's been alone, 
a long time coming but i know a change is gonna come oh yes it will it's been so hard living but i'm afraid to die cause i know what's up there beyond the sky it's been a long Long time coming, but I know the change is gonna come. Oh, yes, it will. I go to the movie and I go downtown. Somebody keeps telling me, no, hang around. It's been a long Long time coming, but I know change is going to come. Oh, yes, it will. Then I go to my brother, and I say, Brother, help me, please. But he winds up knocking me right back on my knees. And oh, there's been times that I thought I couldn't last for this long. But now I think I'm able to carry it's been a long, long time coming, but I know a change is going to come. Oh, yes, it will. Thank you so much, Rachel, for singing for us that that beautiful uh, song with such, such moving lyrics. And we should really pray uh, that a change is going to come. When we, when we see the injustice in the world that is around us, we as Christians, we as representatives of the one who is just, the one who is love, should represent that love and that justice and see that something is wrong. And we should hope and we should pray that change is gonna come. But before that, next week, we're gonna have a Q&A. We're gonna have potentially an interview. We're gonna have a Q&A and we want you guys to send in your questions that you guys might have. They can be as far out there as you want. We wanna tackle this properly. We wanna tackle this deeply. So please do send in your questions. During the week, you'll see on the Instagram, uh, on the story, you can submit your questions there. In your small groups on Friday, um, you can submit your questions there. Uh, and if not, in the description below right now, you can submit your questions and we will try our best to answer them and biblically answer them. Thank you guys so much for watching. It's been a horrible last two weeks and, and 2020 in general. But what's the best thing to do when we see the mess and the horror going around in the world? What did the early church do in Acts? They prayed. So we're going to finish off now in a, in a time of prayer, speaking to the one who listens and has power above all things. So let's pray to him now. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are saddened, upset and outraged by the injustices we see happening now and have been occurring for so long. But we know that you are hurt even greater by the pain your children are going through and the brokenness that has caused it. We pray specifically for the family of George Floyd. They will feel your presence surrounding them. We thank you that those four officers have been arrested and charged. We also seek that your justice and comfort will be reaching those who have suffered under police brutality for the names we do know and those we don't in, the, in America and here in the UK. Lord, we need you and call out to you to be our shepherd direct and guide us towards a change. You are a God of justice. 
you are always on the side of the vulnerable and the oppressed, the poor and the brokenhearted. We are sorry for the times we do not act as your children and reflect your heart for justice. We are sorry for how the church has ignored the sin of racism and failed to act justly. Lord, we need your Holy Spirit to change us, especially your children who are white. We have let this go on for too long. May your Holy Spirit be at work changing our hearts that we might see the world change, that we will cry out for justice for our black brothers and sisters. Lord, I pray for comfort to be with those in our family who have suffered at the hands of racism, whether that be obviously or more covertly. And especially, Lord, for those who are black and have been told for so long that they are not worthy. Lord, may they feel your comfort and confidence that you created them purposefully and intentionally. May they find rest in you and your love and see a change in the way they are treated. Your church should be an example of your character and be glorifying you. And Lord, we repent of how we have let you down in staying silent whilst your children are being oppressed. We know that when one part of the body is hurting, then the whole body is hurting. Help us to show the world the way as well as to be listening and lifting up the voices of those who have been oppressed by the systems of this world. The church should be our clearest picture of unity. We are a community from every tribe, tongue and nation. Help us individually, help us as a church to be upset with the place we are in, to listen to the cries and to be seeking justice as the clearest reflection of you and your character. We don't want to be people who just hear your word on how to act, but we want to be people who do act and show the way. As it says in James, in the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Lord, we want to be people who seek change and live that out in every area and sphere of our lives. We need your revival and call on you. In your precious and holy name, Amen. But you're protected Check by the love of God. Protected, protected, protected. And there's no stopping you. There's no stopping me. Depressed, but I'm free. Oh Lord. I'm free. free. That's the good news.
Thank you. 